Uh, so good afternoon, folks. Uh, I just want to say what a uh, real pleasure it is uh, to be here and, and to be on this stage with uh, my colleagues. Uh, you know, all that we do is all about partnership and cooperation. And, uh, you know, in the, in the time that I've uh, worked with OFAH, your organization, that's what's been the cornerstone of, of our work is uh, the cooperation. So uh, I just want to uh, start off by saying that. Um, Fisheries and Oceans is the lead federal department responsible for um, managing uh, Canada's commercial recreational Aboriginal fisheries. But we can only fully achieve our, uh, our goals with the support and the partnerships. And uh, on this slide, you'll see the, these are the folks that are working with us, or we have the pleasure of working with, your organization and Ducks and our American colleagues. And of course, uh, we can't do our work without uh, Eric and the, and the folks uh, from Ontario as well. So um, looking at your organization, uh, you know, in the time that I've been here, it was back in 2009 at uh, this meeting, we signed the Memorandum of Agreement uh, for uh, supporting the, uh, the Salmon Restoration Initiative. Uh, we've also partnered to uh, work on education, uh, uh, the public and doing outreach on uh, the challenges of uh, aquatic invasive species. Uh, and I'm really pleased uh, to uh, confirm today that uh, uh, DFO and OFAH have uh, recently inked a, an agreement, a uh, two-year agreement, that will see uh, uh, $450,000 uh, going from Fisheries and Oceans to OFAH to uh, work with us on education and outreach specifically related to uh, preventing uh, the introduction and establishment of Asian carp in, in the Great Lakes. So I don't think I need to uh, tell this audience the importance of freshwater commercial or recreational fisheries to our economy. In the Great Lakes alone, they represent some of our most significant fisheries, contributing a combined total ec economic contribution that's estimated about 8.3 billion US dollars a year. It's because of both the economic and social benefits that fisheries provide, fisheries and oceans dedicate programs and funding to improve ecosystem health, protect fish populations, and remediate habitat. Invasive species are one of the largest threats to the biodiversity of Ontario's waters, wetlands, and woodlands. Originating from other or, uh, regions in the world, and in the absence of their natural predators and controls, invading species can have a devastating effect on native species, habitats, and ecosystems. As you can see from the, uh, the map here, uh, we've got more than 182 aquatic invasive species that we can find in the Great Lakes, and uh, the map illustrates some of the challenges in other parts across the country. Many of these species have established and have caused negative impact, and uh, some of the more well-known ones are, uh, as folks have mentioned this afternoon, sea lampreys, uh, the round goby, and of course, zebra mussels. For more than 50 years, working in coordination with the United States through the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission, DFO has delivered the world's largest ongoing invasive species control program. Suppressing sea lampreys in the Great Lakes uh, is the, the root of this uh, program. Without this control program, the restoration of native lake trout and lake weightfish fisheries would not have been possible. Although the control of sea lamprey is a success story, it comes at a considerable cost and with lessons learned. The bottom line is it's much easier and much cheaper to control an invasive species before it gets established than the cost of what it is to maintain and manage it after it's here. From my perspective, uh, through the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission and the work that we do with our sea lamprey control program, it's about $30 million a year that we're investing just to control sea lamprey. Um, recreational boating uh, is also a, a major contributor to the spread of aquatic invasive species. Um, and uh, AIS can be transferred on the hulls, the fishing gear, anchor lines, the live wells, your bilge uh, water, or your bait buckets. Uh, those of us who enjoy uh, our time out in the water know that recreational boaters, can, we can all do our parts by reducing the spread of invasive species by thoroughly inspecting and cleaning boats and trailers and boating equipment and 
draining the water from the motor, from the live well, and from other uh, holding bodies before we move the boat and the trailer from another water uh, body uh, across the Great Lake Basin. Um, as we share the Great Lakes with the United States, and there are established uh, populations of Asian carp, as, as John and David mentioned, in the American waters below uh, the Great Lakes Basin, it's essential that we cooperate and collaborate with our American colleagues and, and American agencies. And I must say that uh, in the five years that uh, I've been working uh, in the region, uh, I've just been uh, completely amazed and proud to be a party of, of this group that's uh, uh, put everything aside to ensure that uh, we protect the, uh, the Great Lakes and not at an insignificant investment uh, from the American uh, uh, government to ensure that this happens. So big head and silver carps are two of the Asian carp species uh, that pose the, uh, I guess, probably the most significant challenge. They're uh, uh, obviously the poster child of uh, Asian carp and what we don't want. Uh, Dave uh, showed the picture of what he wanted and his fish, and I said to him, well, on, on the left there, uh, you see my fish. Um, it was bigger than his. That's about 76-pound baby um, uh, big-headed carp that uh, we brought out about 100 kilometers uh, below Chicago, uh, I guess two years ago. Yeah. And uh, that definitely is not what we want for fishing up here in Canada. Uh, first off, they don't take hooks or anything like that, and, uh, uh, you know, I say it's a baby at 76 pounds, those get up over 100 pounds, uh, and they will eat approximately 20% of their body weight on a, on a daily basis, so that just will completely decimate, as it has in the Mississippi River Delta, the uh, potential for other fisheries, lucrative commercial or recreational fisheries, to survive. Um, the, uh, the, the, I guess probably at this point uh, we should talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing to ensure that Asian carp don't come here. Um, and in reality, we're actually doing quite a bit. In, in 2012, uh, the Minister of Fisheries and Ocean has announced $17.5 million of funding over a five-year period for proactive management of Asian carp in the Great Lakes. And this program, which uh, my staff uh, managed, consists of four pillars, prevention, early warning, response, and management. The program has had many successes to date, such as the development of partnerships and outreach with the Canadian public that pose threats uh, by Asian carp, uh, development of early detection and surveillance sites. Uh, we've done successful removal of uh, two uh, infertile uh, grass carp that we found down in the Grand River in the last year. And while my colleagues have been speaking about the, uh, the, the crisis that's, that's looming with big hidden silver carp, and I support and commend these efforts, I also want to flag our concerns about grass carp and publicly uh, uh, mention that I think, uh, well, from a Canadian government perspective, we look at all of the four species of Asian carp as being serious concern, but uh, with our joint efforts to fight the spread of Asian carp in the Great Lakes, it's, uh, it's focused primarily on, on, on big hit and silver carp. Uh, they eat huge amount of uh, uh, plankton, and uh, clearly, uh, if we're looking at um, the foundation of the food web, uh, any of these are going to pose problems for us. So. Um, when we look at uh, grass carp, they've drawn less attention uh, because they feed on, on plants, including nuisance weeds that choke out uh, boat motors and really get in the way of uh, 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 boating, and, and they can overwhelm the native vegetation. But uh, they have serious uh, impacts on, on our wetlands, and uh, that's where uh, we need that habitat for, uh, for waterfowl, and we also need that uh, habitat for many of the native fish fishes. These were introduced back in the 60s uh, for lake and pond maintenance. Uh, the fish uh, have become widely distributed. They're now uh, established in about uh, uh, 45 states. And as I mentioned, uh, we've had two live captures in, in Canada uh, uh, over the last year or so. And I, and I shouldn't mention that the grass carp are not just a, a, a U.S. issue. Uh, clearly, uh, there's been many uh, 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 groups that have uh, been uh, using grass carp for uh, pond maintenance 
in uh, various uh, jurisdictions across the country. But um, I think what we have to be looking at is the, uh, uh, the reality of what we've done so far is looked at uh, trying to in ensure that we have infertile grass carp, but uh, that's just not going to be the reality in, uh, in society today. If there's a buck to be made, there will be people, and uh, I think uh, this morning we talked about truckers that were bringing uh, fish into the country, and if you can buy uh, uh, infertile grass carp and it's costing you, I don't know, five bucks a fish, and you can get uh, uh, grass carp that are fertile, uh, that are, you're gonna be able to pick them up for 50 cents a fish, uh, clearly there's gonna be lots of people that will take that unethical choice They'll bring those uh, uh, reproductively capable fish in, and if those get in our waterways, uh, work that we've done has proven that it doesn't take too long before you'll have established populations. So clearly, uh, there's a lot of work, and there, uh, there is considerable importance to ensure that uh, we can make uh, it difficult, uh, if not eradicate uh, grass carp uh, in the Lake Erie uh, tributaries where we've been finding them. Um, Clearly, we, uh, we require uh, more information uh, on these type of fish uh, before they can get established. Of course, even if we get a few fish in there, you know, that doesn't mean that we just wash our hands and say, oh, all is lost. That's not the case at all. It's important that we uh, continue with our detection programs to find out and remove any of those individuals from the, uh, the system uh, immediately. And this is where we can use your help. You, uh, you folks uh, are the, uh, the front lines for us. Uh, we don't have the resources to uh, put the staff out there. Uh, we have, uh, you know, identification programs and uh, uh, the fact that you're out on the water, uh, you're, you're probably gonna come into contact with these fish and be the early warning system. So uh, it is important for you to uh, make use of the, uh, the hotline uh, if you've got a fish, even if you don't know what it is, if it's something you haven't seen, use the hotline. We can get it uh, identified and we can head off uh, uh, a rather uh, catastrophic uh, possibility that uh, none of us want to uh, look at. Um, back in, uh, in 2010, uh, uh, our folks in cooperation with the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission and U.S. colleagues we undertook uh, a binational risk assessment uh, that uh, looked at uh, the potential for uh, Asian carp uh, to uh, arrive, and as John and others have mentioned, the, the location where we thought was the most critical was in the, uh, in the uh, Chicago uh, area with the, uh, with the cause. And if we were able to get uh, just less than a half a dozen fish into uh, the Great Lakes, uh, as you can see from these charts, in 20 years, they would basically be able to spread across and be established uh, right across the, uh, the Great Lakes. And it doesn't matter that we have a winter like we've had this year. Um, these are tough critters, and uh, they would survive uh, in the environment uh, that we see in Canada. Um, the, um, I guess, uh, Building on, on the programs that we've done with, with this work and uh, wanting to look at uh, the next threat as we see it, um, we have, um, through uh, John's uh, uh, chair of the uh, Asian Carp Regional Coordinating Committee and the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission, we have uh, recently agreed to uh, lead on behalf of uh, uh, the consortium, I guess we'll call it, uh, another binational study that uh, folks are uh, tuning up to uh, look at uh, what the impacts and what we can do to, uh, to address uh, grass carp. So that will expand the, uh, the knowledge base that uh, has been built up on big head and silver carp for, uh, for glass carp. Um, Turning a, a little bit more to uh, what we've been doing here in, uh, in Canada, uh, we've got a new Asian carp lab. It's up and running in, in Burlington at the Canadian Centre for Inland Waters. Uh, from there, we're monitoring uh, and doing research activities 
Uh, the science program there includes uh, early detections. Uh, we've got a number of sites across the, uh, across the Great Lakes Basin. We're hoping to do a lot more in cooperation with uh, Ontario universities and our American colleagues to get as much telemetry data as we can so we can, we can track fish movements and be able to use that as early detection as we go forward. And as others have mentioned uh, earlier today, uh, you know, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement uh, was recently uh, re, uh, renegotiated and signed. That agreement uh, has uh, come into force back in uh, February, so uh, a little over a year ago. Um, as uh, was also indicated earlier today, uh, we're just putting the finishing touches on the Canada-Ontario, uh, the domestic uh, uh, component of that agreement. And, and that agreement, uh, both parts of it, have a fundamental uh, role uh, for Fisheries and Oceans and, and Eric's group at ONNR, where we're looking at an annex, uh, or we have an annex for aquatic invasive species, and that's going to allow us to uh, continue to do this work into the future. Um, another thing uh, that uh, I want to highlight uh, for you this afternoon uh, that I think is uh, really, really important, it came up in one of the questions this morning, is uh, we are uh, putting uh, into play uh, a regulatory package uh, that uh, will look at aquatic invasive species from a national perspective under the Fisheries Act. Um, we, uh, we very much will uh, be recommending, and, and a lot of the, uh, uh, the input that we've received from OFAH and others uh, has supported our recommendation of looking at invisceration. And uh, while these fish are pretty hardy, um, we've not found too many of them that were able to uh, cause too much damage after they were invisorated. So uh, we're looking at that as being the way to go forward. Clearly, um, the, uh, the issues that we have are the kinds of issues that are going to be with us, and this is going to be a sustained effort, as John had said. It's going to take a lot of uh, cooperation. And the, the key for us here in Canada is uh, finding species before they get established in the Great Lakes. It's, it's a little bit like uh, finding a needle in the haystack, but um, if we can rely on you and your partner organizations to help us, and if we can provide you with the information and tools uh, so that you can identify and know these fish, uh, I think we're in a very good position to be able to put into play the kinds of uh, uh, responses that will ensure that what we have here in Canada is protected and what we're, uh, what we're uh, trying to preserve is, is, is illustrated on, on this slide. We want to be able to uh, sustain our national fisheries. We want to uh, uh, ensure that uh, the challenges and, the, and, and the, uh, the expenditures that have had to be incurred in the United States don't have to uh, happen here in Canada. And with that, I just want to uh, thank you for everything you've done, given us the opportunity to come and talk to you about this uh, today. And thank you so much for being our partner and working with us to ensure that Asian carp don't arrive in Canada. Thank you.